Well, there's four or five hypotheses. One hypothesis is maybe God is visiting and coming to see them. And you can't discount this on, for any, on, on the basis of any scientific evidence. Although I would say, you know, saying that God works in very strange ways. Uh, but it, I find it strange that she would manifest herself in temporal lobe seizures, only in epileptics. But, you know, we don't know. Okay? So, first of all, the idea that God visits you, and I can't disprove that. The second idea is they're just mad. You know, they're just nuts. They're crazy. Something is going on in the temporal lobes. They become crazy, and they believe in God or believe in something. Well, that doesn't work because uh, I've seen other crazy people, people who are schizophrenia, who really are crazy, and majority of them don't necessarily believe in God or become religious. Some of them do. They'll say, I'm Napoleon, or I'm God, or I'm George Bush, or whatever. Okay? But majority of them don't necessarily believe in God. But in temporal seizures, a substantial proportion, maybe 30 to 40 percent, have this intense religious fervor and belief in God. The second hypothesis, third hypothesis, is that maybe there is this cauldron, given that it's limbic system where the seizures originate, and the limbic system is very much involved in emotions, there is this cauldron of emotions, this emotional turmoil in your mind, and then the left hemisphere kicks in. And the left hemisphere we know from a number of experiments on split brain patients and indeed on stroke patients is involved in confabulation. If something doesn't fit, doesn't make any sense, the left hemisphere tries to spin a yarn to try to make things more consistent. So maybe when there is some strange, something bizarre going on in your mind, which is otherwise inexplicable, the left hemisphere starts confabulating and saying, the only way I can make sense of this is there is a visitation from another dimension, i.e., maybe it's God is visiting me. Okay, in other words, God is the ultimate confabulation by the left hemisphere. Okay. Now, another hypothesis is, and I can't rule that out. That's a possibility. Another hypothesis is kindling. That is, when any one of you look at the world, you look at objects around you, look at people, what happens? The messages cascade from the retina into the visual areas of the brain, visual cortex, and about 20 or 30 visual areas in the brain. And you compute the statistics of the world. You look at features. You analyze the features. Finally, you recognize objects. And objects then produce the appropriate emotional experience. In other words, the amygdala, which is the gateway to the limbic system, performs an emotional surveillance and looks for emotional significance. If something like a predator or a prey or the dean or something very salient like that, <laughs> you're emotional or something sexual, you get emotionally aroused and you start sweating and your heart starts beating faster because of autonomic arousal that takes place and you're preparing the body for feeding, uh, feeding fleeing, fighting, or sexual behavior, as the saying goes. Okay. So all of this takes place instantaneously, very, very quickly. And maybe what's happened to these patients is because of the repeated volleys of temporal lobe seizures, some of these connections have been indiscriminately enhanced. And when that happens, everything becomes deeply significant and salient. So normally, when I look at this, you know, if I look at a pinup or I look at a lion, I get aroused. But I look at this, I don't get aroused by a bottle of water. But these people, because of the kindling, Everything and anything they look at is deeply significant. And they see infinity in a, in a grain of sand or whatever. And they see everything they look at is deeply profound and deeply significant. And this is akin to many, what many religious mystics talk about, seeing deep significance in all everything in the cosmos. Now, how do you test that idea? Well, we said, OK, let's measure their sweating. You can do this with a galvanic skin response, where the sweating changes. When you look at something significant, you look at uh, 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 um, a lion or a tiger, or you look at something sexually provocative, then you get a huge galvanic skin response. If you look at a table or a chair, your galvanic skin response is flat. You don't react. What happens in a temporal lobe epileptic? We said, well, if this hypothesis is correct, anything and everything should produce a big jolt in the, temp in the galvanic skin response. So we did this experiment. We showed them, of course, lions and tigers, they get a big galvanic skin response, or a pinup, they get a big, oh, I take that back. Lions and tigers, violent scenes, horrible scenes, they get a big galvanic skin response. But we show them things which are utterly trivial, like bottles of water or a shoe or a, a pen or something. Nothing happens, as in a normal person. In other words, the theory that this is just kindling and everything is deeply significant is disproved. In fact, when they look at sexually provocative images, they don't get a galvanic skin response, unlike most normal people. right? And this is consistent with the fact they actually have hyposexuality. Their libido is reduced in temporal lobe epilepsy. 
But now comes the important finding. When we showed them religious icons, like a star of David, a cross, or a word God, or the word Mary, the word Jesus, there's a big jolt in the galvanic skin response. Showing, and what we said in this abstract of Society for Neuroscience about what, eight, nine years ago now, that something is going on in the temporal lobes, in temporal lobe epilepsy, and maybe in all of our temporal lobes. There's a group of neurons which is firing in abnormal manner, which makes you more prone to religious belief, okay, believing in a, in a deity or in, in, in God or whatever. And this, these neurons are hyperactive in these people, hence the propensity to religious belief. That's all we said. In fact, at the end of the abstract, the last line was, this does not prove there's a God module in the brain. But the press got hold of this and went crazy and said, Ramachandran has discovered the God center in the brain. And in fact, the Bishop of Oxford was questioned about this. And he said, well, so what? It just shows that when God made us, he put an antenna in all our brains, and it just happens to be in the temporal lobes. Fine, OK? So anyway, and the, the, for some time in the internet, there was a talk about a G spot in the brain. And so, <laughs> okay. All right, so now the question then is, why do, you have, why do you have this neural circuitry in your brain whose activity gives rise to religious belief? Finally, there are two possibilities. One is it's a spandrel. In other words, it's doing something else in the brain which has evolutionary benefit. I don't know what that might be, right? Belief and maybe, it, it, uh, I don't know. I don't want to even speculate. The other possibility is it was, in fact, selected for by natural selection because, in fact, uh, look at every religion, every society, every tribe in the world. They have some kind of religious belief. Uh, and this rituals, the belief in a hierarchy, the, the ritual chanting, the mantras, the dances, and all of that confers a certain stability and order on society. And maybe that's what provided the selection pressure for the emer emergence of religious belief and God. Finally, let me conclude by saying none of this has any bearing on whether God really exists or not. As I said before, this is all about how religious belief originates in the brain, and that's all, that's all I have to say. Thank you.